Funding for the Hinckley Report is provided in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Foundation Fund, Merit Medical, and by contributions to PBS Utah from viewers like you. Thank you. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, our panel recaps a summer filled with heated races and consequential political battles. Historic surprises and new developments create implications for the November election. And local leaders push to amend the state constitution. Good evening and welcome to the ninth season of the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Lindsay Ertz, reporter for KSL 5 TV, Max Roth, anchor for Fox 13 News, and Glenn Mills, director of government relations for the Utah Department of Corrections. We're so glad to have you all in on the season premiere of the Hinkley Report. What yeah. a summer. Wow, I can't even believe <laughs> oh, all that has yeah. happened. Yeah. Well, you're gonna break it down today. We're gonna, a little bit about what's happened, a little bit what's happening now, and what we're gonna see going forward. I think we'll start today with uh, a sort of a recap of some of these, uh, the primaries that occurred in the state of Utah, because what happened there is going to reflect what comes here through no, all the way through November. I wanna start with the second congressional district with you, Lindsay. Uh, Celeste Malloy uh, ended up winning that primary by 176 votes. Mm -hmm. So close. That's after a recount. Right. A lot happened in this race. Uh, kind of give us some of the key themes that you saw in this race. Yeah, well, I think the closeness of the race is one of the key themes, right? Um, you saw uh, Senator Mike Lee endorse her challenger, Colby Jenkins, in the uh, convention portion of the primary race, right? And that really boosted him at convention. And he really did it in this kind of like two days before the convention kind of way, really trying to uh, almost knock her off. She didn't gather signatures, right? So she had to win a convention, which she didn't, but she won enough that she made it to a primary ballot, right? And so you saw that endorsement really uh, kind of boost him in that way. I don't know if it's so much translated to the primary, but just the closeness of this race was so interesting to me. Um, it really goes to show that I know we say this all the time and it sounds taboo, but every vote counts, yeah. right? I mean, we had to recount this. There were lawsuits challenging some of the um, uh, ballots that got postmarked in Vegas, right? And so um, I think th the crux of this race came down to Washington County, right? Celeste Malloy, um, won most of the counties, Colby Jenkins won by a lot Washington County. And so that's a juxtaposition to what Celeste Malloy did in her 2023 race, right? Or 2022 race, right? Where she really took that rural and Washington County area. Mm -hmm. And so uh, her, uh, him taking that county was really where he made most of his votes. Mm -hmm. Let's break down a couple yeah. of these themes that Lindsay just talked. So Max, let's talk about this endorsement issue for just a moment, because mm -hmm. as Lindsay, Lindsay just said, two days before the convention, mm -hmm. Mike Lee, um, it sounds like without con talking to Celeste Malloy, yeah. endorsed her opponent. Talk about the impact of that and maybe some of the endorsements that followed that may have helped her. Well, uh, he, now Colby Jenkins got Mike Lee and uh, Celeste Malloy essentially got everyone else. Um, but that Lee endorsement, uh, it was a big deal because Lee is the darling of the congressional delegation among grassroots Republicans. And so, uh, you know, Romney's considered by so many in the grassroots as a, as a rhino, Republican in name only. There's some real bitterness uh, there. And, uh, and even the other uh, representatives, uh, aside from Burgess Owens, who is unopposed, um, but, but, the, uh, but Curtis and Moore um, were, uh, are, are considered uh, uh, a, a little bit more moderate. And so Lee has probably more oomph than even that they're the whole of the others and Donald Trump coming in and endorsing her as well. An uh, important thing I saw play out at convention, I was actually there, is she had a really good response to that. In her speech, she went through a bunch of names of people she's not going to bow down to. And the very last one was a senator. Mm -hmm. We knew exactly who she was talking about. Yeah. Uh, it played well with the crowd. And as you mentioned, Mike Lee does very well with the convention crowd. But that race at convention, she didn't win, mm -hmm. but it was close. And she qualified for the primary as a result of that. So and she have, still did fairly well at convention. I haven't done my own reporting on this, but I have seen some uh, allegations out there that actually some money came in, not only from Senator Lee and his PAC, um, but Elon Musk even to Colby Jenkins. 
And so you saw not only uh, Mike Lee try to take aim at this race in the convention, but then in the general, or sorry, in the primary as well, the, the broader primary once she was on the ballot. Uh, and so I found that really, really fascinating that they really went all in to try to unseat this incumbent. Mm -hmm. As you talk about those, Glenn, to your point, please do the follow-up, but also uh, former President Donald Trump endorsed Celeste Malloy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Opposite side, even though mm -hmm. Senator Lee and Trump have had this these discussions about a couple of the other candidates. Right, you would think, I mean, Conventional wisdom, pun intended, would uh, lead you to believe that maybe that kind of balanced everything out there. Uh, however, if you look at polling in the state of Utah, specifically to President Trump in an endorsement, a majority of people polled suggested that that endorsement either made no difference at all or made them vote for the other person. So it, th there's really a different ways you can look at how endorsements played out. But as Max mentioned, one of the key points there is everyone else, everyone else from the congressional delegation came out in favor of uh, Representative Malloy. You Matt, know, I, oh, yeah. oh, I, I was just going to say, um, I think it's an elephant in the room, but I think it's something we have to think about, which is, um, which is the fact that she's the woman in the congressional delegation and, uh, and Utah's track record with elected women is not so great in terms of uh, Democrat and Republican. Prior to Celeste Malloy, we've had four women in the House, none in the Senate. The average number of years for those women uh, from Utah in the House of Representatives is three. And the average for everyone else, meaning men, is over seven. Um, now, I don't know if we have enough women who have served at this point to have a pattern, and that's a whole other question, but, um, but it feels like there's a pattern there. And I don't know, I don't know exactly how to put my finger on it, um, but why, why, why her? Why her and, and not more, who, who tends to gravitate towards the center and towards uh, being a part of the, of, of the uh, organization? of the House and the Republican hierarchy, that sort of thing, and or Owens or Curtis. I mean, Curtis not running this year in that right in yeah. the House. Well, you don't have to run for office yet, Lindsay, but at no, least not today. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> I just asked the question. How, how does this play out in the people you're interviewing, you're talking to, when we have, we have like our whole congressional delegation uh, in, in Congress endorsing her, Mike Lee is not, they're probably gonna have to work together here. Yeah, uh, it's a really, a really interesting divide because you don't usually see the, the federal delegation split this way, right? And so, I don't know, it was just this really um, interesting dynamic where he just really took aim at her. I don't know whether it was he saw that seat in particular as vulnerable, uh, like Max was saying, he could have gone after you know, Burgess Owens. He didn't even have a challenger. He could have recruited somebody to run against him. He didn't. Um, clearly it was the whatever policies he didn't like of Celeste Malloy, and in my conversations with her, uh, it was some of her votes uh, on the, I think it was the FISA issue and uh, one other one at the time um, that he didn't like. And that's where you saw, as uh, to Glenn's point, her say, I'm not gonna bow to a center, because he had actually called her and said, I didn't like the way you, you voted on this, and um, but she didn't know he was really gonna take aim at her campaign. So he clearly wasn't happy with the votes that she took and he, to say the quiet part out loud, he punished her for it. And I, I'll just say this, I think we've all been around politics to know, uh, long enough to know that when something like that happens, it's always in the back of your head. Mm -hmm. You just don't blow it away. Mm -hmm. uh, grudges uh, can stick around for quite a while when you're talking politics. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to, well, there's one more point I want to make on this because Lindsay brought it up for you, Max. This is for our viewers down mm -hmm. in Washington County, yeah, southern part yeah. of the state. 34% of the GOP voters in that district live in Washington County. Mm -hmm. I, talk, I mean, that's a dynamic that's not just going to shape yeah. this race, but few, those in the future. Well, and that's what's, uh, the, you know, that's what's going on with Utah's congressional delegation. I know we'll get into it at some point in this program with the initiative process and, oh, yes. and what's really controversial there. But uh, the fact that Salt Lake County has been, I was going to say bifurcated, but what is it, quadrificated? It's in, you know, split in, split in four. Um, the, uh, so each, uh, e each of these seats has a dominant county. None of them is Salt Lake. So uh, the third district, Utah County, the first district is Weber, the second district is, uh, is Washington now. Washington has more, more voters uh, in that district, and Washington is a big 
County. It's now, uh, it's gonna start rivaling the Wasatch Front. It's not quite there yet, about 200,000 people to 260 or something like that for Weber County, but it's getting there. Mm -hmm. and, and an interesting dynamic um, there in Washington County is they have long been pushing for a district where they could make a difference in, and we do see that now in that uh, district. But when you take a look at the breakdown between the 2023 20, special election and this time around, uh, Celeste's numbers aren't that different, really. She dropped, I think, maybe three points in Washington County. The difference was the special election was more spread out with more candidates. This time it was just one-on-one. -on -one. Let me get to a couple other races. Lindsay, let's talk about the governor's race. Uh, Spencer Cox, Deidre Henderson, 54.4% uh, of the vote. That's just a little under 10 points in that race against Phil Lyman. Some dynamics there because that is continuing because they're not just off the ballot. We might have a write-in candidate or two. Yeah, we, we do have a couple of Lyman write-in candidates now, right, which is interesting. Um, certainly a tactic that uh, I don't know that it's coming from the Cox campaign, but uh, certainly a tactic that is used in politics, right? When you run a write-in campaign, you put another person on the ballot with the same last name because we're an intent state, right? So long as we can tell who you intended to vote for, it'll count. However, if there's only one Lyman or two Lymans and you write Lyman, then it won't mm -hmm. count, right? So you've got to specify Phil Lyman or Phil and Natalie or something like that. Uh, but the Cox Lyman race was really interesting because I think that the Cox campaign a little bit rested on their laurels when it came to how much they thought they were gonna win that primary. Only won by what, 10 points, something like right. that. And I think a lot of politicos thought it was going to be a much larger spread. And it kind of proves this contingent of how we're seeing this kind of split in the Republican Party and Utah's Republican Party between sort of more mainstream Republicans, maybe more moderate versus this further right wing of the party. Uh, Governor Cox calls it the populist wing, yeah. even more conservative wing, right? So um, uh, Phil was, uh, I think he performed a masterclass in social media in terms of stirring up controversy, and he'll admit this to you, right, where that is his MO. That is what he does. He is active on Twitter or whoever's running his Twitter. Actually, I don't even know if he runs it, but whoever's running his Twitter uh, is very active on there. He did make some pretty outlandish allegations, and I think that's where you saw the Cox campaign get really frustrated. Mm -hmm. It was like, look, our signature gathering company is actually not under federal investigation, or, or criminal investigation, I should say. Uh, one person had an issue, one contractor, right, had an issue, but you saw the Lyman campaign try to drive a wedge there and is still claiming that they should be able to see those right. signatures that got Cox on the ballot. And so, um, I mean, when you're the underdog, you gotta pull out all the stops. But it was an interesting dynamic to see what played in the primary and that Cox, I'll say, only won by a 10% percent percentage point. One of the most fascinating things to me about that race, and it goes to your point of who is running the social media side for uh, Phil Lyman, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say not him, mm -hmm. and here's why. Because he was punching, he was swinging every chance possible when it came to social media, but when the two of them met up for their Utah Debate Commission debate, he was very cordial. Well, he is I was, in real life, and he's I was, personable. Yeah, and he he's, is. Yeah. I think everyone was watching that, though, and expecting far more fireworks and yeah. him to really go after the governor, and it just didn't happen face to face. And there are things going on in that campaign that reflect the national mood, um, in that uh, yeah, Phil Lyman and his folks think that if they go after the process, the integrity of the process, that's their way in. Um, and that's something that we also know is happening on the national level, and it's something that's uh, hard, to, hard to get your, your head around, is that that, um, that then becomes, how do you have that conversation when the assumption is, by a, a, a significant percentage of the population, that there's something awry? I want to get to the, um, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say, I think it, it you really have to kind of look at some of the allegations, though, Phil was making. He took some of them to court. The, the court has said, nope, not a thing. We're now doing an audit of the signatures. The auditor's office had said, nope, not a thing, right? So you can make those allegations all day long, but people have proven you time and time again that your allegations actually aren't true. And so it's really dragging out this process and, and frankly getting a little tired, right, of, of how much he's kind of coming out and, and kind of making these claims when he's had body and, and body after body really say this isn't accurate. But to Max's point, along with the national uh, scene, what we're seeing, mm -hmm. people are buying that. 
Yeah. He has a strong base that is backing him 100%, and they're buying everything that's being put out there. Hey, Glenn, take for just a moment. I'm not going to go through a couple of these other races, but from other, for our Senate, you know, Congressman Curtis and his race, Burgess Owens unopposed, more. Talk about an underlying theme here about the people who did very well sure. at the conventions and uh, did not do well at conventions, but they're the ones they're going to be voting for. To me, the biggest storyline from this election, the primary election, is the radical difference between the results we saw at convention and the results we saw in the primary. For the first time I can think of since uh, the signature path was implemented, we had three candidates who would not have even qualified for the primary if it were up to the convention only, win their races. And a lot of people, uh, specifically Lyman supporters, will say it was a close race, but still a nine-point win is a big victory. Uh, it, uh, 37,000 votes. But the other two, uh, John Curtis in the race for Senate mm -hmm. and Derek Brown in the race for Attorney General, they won their primaries easily. Mm -hmm. And they would not have even been on the ballot mm -hmm. if it were for convention only. Representative Moore lost the convention by 10 points and wins the primary by more than 40 points. Mm -hmm. That's a big storyline coming out this year. Mm -hmm. we'll, see, we'll see how that plays out. Certainly, we've, we've thought that this might be coming, but we saw it clear in some of these races. Can we get to the presidential races for just a moment? Um, as we see the, the, the slates uh, set, including who's running for president and the vice president, there's a couple interesting polling questions that we talked about here in the state of Utah. Uh, and, and Lindsay, we'll start with you on this, about whether or not people agreed with President Biden's decision to drop out of the race. That's the first one. 81% of Utahns agreed with that. That was Republicans and Democrats. I mentioned that, you know, it was 85 percent GOP, 81 percent the Democrats agreed, which is interesting because some Republicans who agreed with that decision were the very ones that thought that he's the one that Trump could beat. Right, right. exactly. If they wanted uh, Trump to win, they should have wanted Biden to stay in the race, right? Uh, but I think Biden pulling out of the race was just a masterclass for the Democrats, right? Because uh, it felt like right after President Trump uh, had the assassination attempt, a lot of momentum swung towards his corner. I kind of attribute that to, uh, you know, our collective sympathy for like, this should not have gotten to that level, right, of someone potentially getting shot. Um, but so you saw a lot of momentum swing there. But as uh, Biden dropped out and Kamala jumped into the race, Vice President Harris jumped into the race, um, you've seen some of the momentum swing back towards the Democrats, I think, where um, that has really energized the party. They've coalesced around her, delegates coalesced around her. And so, uh, yeah, everyone thought he should drop out, but it's interesting that now it's sort of swung towards her having this momentum. You know what I see in that poll, too, uh, in, in those results, is that uh, most people are, you know, are tend to be pretty honorable and reasonable. And, uh, and so if you're, uh, if you're a Republican and your argument and you've been worried uh, and, and have stated that worry that the president is losing a step or two, uh, and then he does step away because of those worries, uh, then, um, then you, you, if a pollster asks you, uh, should he have stepped uh, aside, of, yeah. If you if if you're not comfortable with cognitive dissonance, which none of us are supposed to be, then you say, yeah, that was the right decision. I've been saying that he needs to step aside for a long time, even though it's not advantageous mm -hmm. uh, to your party. And so I think I think that's what we're seeing is that the 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 normal person out there, you know, they get a question and they think, well, I said it before, I, I better yeah. be consistent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think another important point, along with. Uh, what we brought up about the assassination attempt was the debate performance. That was painful. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anyone walked away with that feeling good about the president's ability to do this for four more years. So that really is where the momentum shift started sure. at that point, and then it just kind of built from there on out. And then as soon as that change was made, we started to see some movement. Yeah, uh, talk about that for just a moment. And Max, you brought this up, so maybe you can talk about this, this other polling question, because we started talking about age oh, yeah. of our candidates, you know, and what point should you know, we be thinking about whether or not they're running. So we asked Utahns, the Hinckley Institute and the Deseret News, asked Utahns if there should be maximum age limits for elected officials. What's interesting is 62% of Utahns said there should be, and that's you know, high among the Republicans and the Democrats. And what's interesting, I want to talk about that, particularly when I say, well, what age yeah, should be the maximum yeah. age? Yeah. 70, okay. that was 29%. 
percent of Utahns said no more than 70. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and, and then if you add that to the number of Utahns who said 60 or 65, uh, then you, you have a majority saying definitely younger than 70. Um, it is a fascinating question. We've had, uh, in my head, I, I, what I can remember from history and modern times is that we've essentially had two presidents who've been old enough to challenge that so far. And that is, uh, well, no, Donald Trump, was he over 70 by the time he yeah, was out of office? Because now he's, yeah. now he yeah. is, but in, in office he was. Um, so, so then three, Trump and Biden and uh, Reagan. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, Reagan uh, is considered a lion of the Republican Party at this exactly. point. So it's uh, an that, interesting. That's answer. what's funny about that is mm -hmm. because Utahns love Ronald Reagan. Yeah. yeah. And if that were in place, he wouldn't have been eligible for the presidency. But we also know now, just historically, that Ronald Reagan was in the early stages of Alzheimer's or dementia, probably at the end of his term. At least he had gotten to later stages quickly enough that you would make that assumption. Mm. I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about a constitutional amendment. We have several, but I want to talk about Constitutional Amendment D, all right, as a dog, D, yeah. uh, which is very interesting here because this is a result of a Utah Supreme Court ruling. If you can give us the brief, uh, a brief rundown of that, and I'll, I'll go, yes. Yeah. I, uh, it's, you're right, you're yeah, brief. Yeah, Come on, counsel, yeah, give us the brief. I, can I do that? This. Um, yeah, so the Supreme Court ruling in July basically limited the state legislature uh, in in the way they can overturn initiatives. It basically said that when it comes to these initiatives that involve reforming government, you cannot impair the the intent of the voters, right? That's the, the very simplified version of you can change it, you can tweak it, you can alter it. You can support the reform so long as you don't overturn what the voters wanted. Well, the legislature is now saying, we need the ability to be able to tweak initiatives. What if an initiative comes through that bankrupts the state? We've got to make these um, important changes uh, after a citizen's initiative is passed, because otherwise there could be some grave consequences. But a lot of the reaction that I'm seeing online is saying, no, Utah's constitution specifically states right now that the right to alter and reform the government belongs to the people and the, the people who support, or excuse me, who oppose this amendment believe that um, that right should stay with the people and that this attempt by the legislature, they're calling it a attempt to usurp the will of the people. Mm -hmm. Max, talk about this for a second. Isn't that, yeah. oh, did you, you, you had a comment I, first? Well, I think the bigger concern uh, uh, in the immediate uh, and, and is what we just learned this week was the language that is going to be on the ballot because uh, honestly, it feels a little Orwellian. It, it feels like um, uh, it, like the voters are going to go into the booth or they're going to look at their mail, and and what it's going to ask them is, do you support strengthening the initiative process, and do you support keeping foreign influence out of the initiative process? And uh, there, you, you, we all know there are solid arguments. Whatever side you fall on, there's an argument for the for the legislature's side of this. But that wording. Mm -hmm. Doesn't doesn't give people it's even a chance subjective. to understand what the you know what the yeah. argument is or and what they're voting on. When I saw it, I, I just felt like it didn't get to the crux of the no. issue, which is that the if the amendment approve, is approved, it gives the legislature the ability to outright repeal initiatives. Yeah. And so that, to me, is the crux of the issue. So seeing the question, do you want to strengthen the initiative process? Yes, you could make the argument that yeah. it does strengthen the initiative process by banning but foreign money. An right, but that is a, yeah, that is subjective, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's where a lot of the criticism is coming, is that the language isn't neutral. Yeah. Um, and you've seen even some Republicans who voted to put this issue on the ballot come out and say, this is not what I voted for when I uh, wanted to put this to the people. You, you saw it early on in the process, though, that that was the route that they were going to take. You know, really hone in on what may resonate with the people of Utah, and so we're seeing them follow through on that. Uh, I think we've probably all visited states maybe this time of year where you go there and every single commercial is about a ballot initiative. So a lot of people can kind of relate to that and see that and that's what they're hoping to be able to play on. And it's, 
I think what voters have to parse out here is the ultimate question is who should have the final say when it comes to how the people uh, initiate laws. If a law is created by people, the people, should that be the final say or should the legislature have an ability to tweak, amend, mm -hmm. even repeal that initiative? So, so Max, talk about that, that very good point right there because that's mm -hmm. what the legislature and the people are talking about. Yeah. You have the intent of the people in their initiative. Uh, legislators are saying, well, we don't feel like when we pass a law, it's infallible and never be mm -hmm. touched again. Yeah. Is, that where, is that where this is? How is this going to play out? Well, it, it's, it, there's a, and that is, it's a really, it's a good point. Both, both sides clearly have a strong argument, and the argument on the side of the legislature is that initiatives are clunky. I mean, you, you create language, and once it's in, that's what people vote on, and that's what's a law. And if they can't tweak it, like we were saying, I mean, laws get tweaked. They, you have to adjust for what their impact is. Um, but what the legislature has, has done in recent years with uh, the uh, marijuana, with uh, Medicaid, uh, and with the citizen ballot initiatives is essentially completely overturn the decision of the, of the voters. I it's think have to be the last comment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, Glenn. We'll save so it for the next show. Day. It's so much going on. Thank Went you so fast. much. And thank you for watching the Hinkley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. And tonight we want to remind our viewers about a unique challenge grant matching donations dollar for dollar up to $2,000 throughout our, pub our block of public affairs programming. Please go to pbsutah.org and make a donation if you are able. And thanks for supporting programs like The Hinkley Report. Again, thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Funding for The Hinkley Report is provided in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Foundation Fund, Merit Medical, and by contributions to PBS Utah from viewers like you. Thank you.